unstable predictions in the energy sector. Good afternoon, Irina Slav. Good morning, David Blackmon. It's a pleasure to have you here again. Hello. Oh. Uh, forecasts about energies, natural supply, natural gas supply, uh, guidelines to stop exploration, oil exploration, and things, uh, fantastic batteries. Every day we have a news about fantastic batteries for 10 years. 10 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, what, what do you have most important controversial uh, uh, predictions nowadays, uh, David Blackman? Well, you know, uh, I, I guess you know, when you think about this, uh, we have constantly been promised, I, I think, by boosters of wind and solar power, that if we just continue to print trillions of dollars and subsidize them, into existence, you know, it, it can never be done just through the natural market process. It's always got to be through government incentives, like the ones we have in place here in the United States, that we'll just be able to displace all this dirty oil and gas and coal and replace it with solar arrays and, and wind farms and everything's our future is going to be bright and clean. But, you know, we've, we've, done that. We've, we've printed trillions of dollars and, and, and put those subsidies into these rent-seeking industries. And um, they really haven't displaced hardly any oil and gas at all. Really haven't displaced any. Oil and gas demand continues to grow. And it really, for natural gas, it's at an all-time record high at this point, which is why the prices are so strong. Uh, we have displaced uh, a certain percentage of coal, at least in the United States and, and in Europe. Uh, but that's been done mainly with natural gas power generation and coal demand in China and other parts of the world continues to rise very rapidly. So uh, we had, and I, I think the, uh, an irony, a bit of irony we saw late last week was the state of California's government tacitly admitting this. Uh, the state news broke in the Sacramento Bee on Friday that uh, Gavin Newsom's government is seeking $5.2 billion budget allocation to create a new uh, reserve capacity for the California grid and how they're going to create this big uh, reserve capacity is to not retire a bunch of natural gas power plants, older plants that they are scheduled to retire in 2023 and 2024. Uh, they're gonna keep those active. They're going to rehabilitate them and keep them as part of this big new power reserve. And so, what does that tell us? It tells us that here's a state that has spent billions and billions of dollars subsidizing wind and solar to displace natural gas power generation on its grid. Now having to admit that they are not doing the job that they you know, were promised they would do um, in, in generating you know, all the power the state will need while we retire all this fossil fuel generating capacity. So that to me, you know, was just uh, uh, the main bit of news that uh, indicates what is really happening, which is we need energy and we're going to continue to need fossil fuel energy and even boosters of wind and solar like the Democrats in, in California are being forced to admit it really every day. And uh, so that's just one. One of several. Irina, do you have some? Oh, yes. Uh, I, uh, I especially like the um, energy demand uh, and supply forecasts of the International Energy Agency. I have a weakness <laughs> for, for the International Energy Agency. Uh, and, of, of course, my favorite is their uh, roadmap to net zero, uh, which they published last year, uh, in which the IEA said that we won't need investments in new oil and gas exploration. That investment, uh, exploration and investment uh, in new exploration for new production could end uh, with uh, 2021. 
because we wouldn't need it because of wind and solar and hydrogen and all that. And just a few months later, the same agency was calling on OPEC Plus to boost production and to boost investment in uh, new uh, oil and gas exploration. Uh, now we have the same thing. Two months ago, uh, the International Energy Agency said uh, sanctions against uh, Russia will uh, reduce supply of oil by about uh, 3 million barrels daily. Now they're saying it's fine, we'll cope because of lower demand. The only thing that is lowering demand right now are the lockdowns in China. But meanwhile, in Europe and in the United States, demand is still growing despite higher prices. So really, can you, can you trust these forecasts? And then there was uh, BP, by the way, uh, which uh, um, in the beginning of the pandemic two years ago, uh, one of their annual uh, demand and supply forecasts. Uh, they said that uh, that's it for oil demand growth. It had peaked in 2019 and it was not going to grow at all anymore. <laughs> Did that turn out to be true? But let me ask you, uh, Irina and David, is it normal for a transition time, in this case of energy, transition energy, that we have so, uh, let's see, uncertainties that people try error and, and wrong? And is it normal? Is it acceptable, these this things? Well, it's normal. Uh, certainly, it's normal um, I, for any transition. I mean, you're talking about just an, an enormous, massive transition, not just of the energy sector, but really of entire the entire global economy, because the entire global economy has for a century been, been wholly dependent, not wholly dependent, but mainly dependent on fossil fuel energy uh, for, for power generation and transportation. And so when you talk about eliminating fossil fuels and replacing them with other things um, that are far less energy dense, these, these, these other sources, um, you're talking about a transformation of an entire global economy. <laughs> And, and so, yes, it's, it's normal, but is it acceptable? I don't think it's acceptable that, that governments, through government fiat in, in, in the entire Western world, we have been forcing in a lot of jurisdictions premature retirement of fossil fuel energy sources uh, on a promise based on just a promise that wind and solar are going to be able to do a job that anyone with any understanding of physics and thermodynamics know they cannot do at scale. Uh, even, you know, even if the miracle new battery technology that's always just around the corner ever actually arrives, they're still not going to be able to displace fossil fuel energy with those two energy sources. Now, you may be able to develop, say, nuclear fusion, which is also always just around the corner, but never seems to actually arrive, and, and displace it with that to some extent. But the thought that, that you're ever actually going to be able to do this with wind and solar is, is simply false. It's a false premise based on a fantasy world that does not exist. So I think it's normal to have these stops and starts and disruptions, but uh, because of the false premise behind so much of it is, is it absolutely not acceptable. I think there's a, there's a, there's a question of degree. To what degree uh, the forecasters can allow for a margin of error because there's always a margin of error because of so many uncertainties and uh, so many changeable uh, uh, factors, so many variables. But I think that the degree to which the International Energy Agency uh, has been wrong is uh, really impressive because their analysts are supposed to be good. All right. Uh, and yet it appears that they are uh, forecasting demand uh, for oil based on what, uh, you know, what 
governments want to to be uh, the state of affairs rather than on reality and that's problematic because you're basing these forecasts and people are basing their investment decisions on sure. such forecasts but yeah. these forecasts are not in fact grounded in fact uh it is the same with electric vehicles there's such bombastic forecasts uh, about uh, ev adoption but it seems that nobody stopped to think how much copper or how much steel or how much lithium all these millions upon millions of EVs will require. It's like they expected that the materials are all there, the commodities are all there, but they're not. Right. And now this reality of uh, insufficient raw materials is starting to leak in and suddenly everybody is warning about shortages. And, 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 price, actual, and price are soaring. Yes, yes, prices are soaring because of the shortages. Which shortages are um, expected on the basis of other forecasts for the great adoption of millions of EVs? It's sort of a vicious circle, I think. That's it's, where it's, we've come to. It's also a science of wishful thinking, right? Yes, yes. I mean, that, that's what, what so. all of this, quote, science is based on, is wishful thinking Dreams. rather than sterile scientific analysis of the world as it actually exists. And, you know, that's a recipe for, for disaster. And we see it happening all over the place. And, and it's in interesting because Germany stopped uh, the uh, uh, atomic uh, energy in the country, uh, remaining only three plants, I suppose. And nowadays they are rethinking to maintain, to keep this at the same time, yesterday, I saw something related to Nord Stream 2 that they, they are thinking to re, reoperate, they put the license to, to, to they make are. operate. Yeah. So it's very curious. So the trends are in different positions, different directions every day. Well, in California, too, is also similar to Europe, which they both, you know, use, tried to uh, accelerate a transition based on government policy. California has also uh, recently, just a couple of weeks ago, said that they're not going to retire. They're one remaining power plant, nuclear power plant. They're going to work to keep it open. Why? Because wind and solar aren't doing the job they claim they would be able to do. Well, it's good to be reality, uh, to, to see reality reasserting itself. Yeah, yeah. I, I would love to see our own government here, here in Texas start rethinking what it's been doing with our grid, because frankly, uh, we, we've been going down the same road as California, just at a slower pace. And now all of the disaster that has been happening in California for a decade is starting to happen here in Texas. And so we're either going to have to uh, restate or rethink those policies and start acting rationally where our grid's concerned, or we're going to end up becoming a the third world basket case energy state, just like California has been. It's interesting because in Brazil, we are almost in the, the new elections. On October, we have presidential elections, <clears throat> sorry. And um, uh, as the price of uh, fuels are soaring in Brazil, diesel and gasoline, as in never every part of the world, the president is trying to replace the CEO of the company, Petrobras is the main company, Every every two, three, four months, yes. to <laughs> blaming them, they are not uh, let's see responsible for this solution. So the mindset's yeah. confusing. Yeah, Petrobras is, is doesn't set the policy right. It just has to try to implement it. Yeah. But they want to privatize it now. There, there's again this talk of privatizing it. How would this solve the problem? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, sure. And more than three decades, they are talking about privatizing the company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's not new again, and depends on the Congress approval. So it's not so simple to, to make a decision to privatize yeah. the company. So it's a, it's a challenge. Very good. Excellent talking today. Thank you so much for this nice Thank you. Monday. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank great you. Great discussion. Good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a great day. You too. You too. Thank you.